Well, thank you, Ralph, for that nice invitation. Thank you to the Origins Institute and the Hooker Lectureship for getting me here tonight to speak to you. And thank all of you for coming. I'm very happy to be able to share the, uh, a lifelong interest of mine with you. And I'm sure you share the interest or you wouldn't be here, right? I'll tell you what I'm going to do tonight. We're going to start by defining what I mean by synthetic biology and systems biology, because these are not necessarily uh, familiar words to uh, most people. Uh, I'm going to tell you how this uh, impinges on our understanding of the origin of life. We're going to hear about uh, how the kind of research that we're doing in that area. We're going to visit some uh, stars together tonight. We're going to visit uh, the planet Earth early in its history and see uh, what happened to the Earth preceding the origin of life. We're going to talk about what the Earth was like by visiting a volcano in Kamchatka, far eastern Russia. And you're going to uh, see what I saw there as I looked at what we call an analog environment, a place that's life, that's like the way we think the Earth was about four billion years ago. Then we're going to take a dive into the nanoscale studies that uh, must have been part of, uh, and certainly is a part of what I do on my research on the origin of life. Because the origin of life, life really does exer exist at the micro and the nano scale. Now micro, of course, you're familiar with microscopes. They let us see things that are uh, you know, visible to the eye through the microscope in the micron size range. Nano is a thousand times smaller than micro, but molecules are nanoscopic. So we're going to look at DNA, we're going to look at lipid molecules that can form membranes, and I'm going to show you how we're trying to put together a model of the origin of life using what we can do in the laboratory at the nano scale. So uh, it gets a little bit technical toward the end. I'm going to, my job is to help you understand what we're doing, and I'm going to be happy to uh, interact with you after the talk and answer questions that you might have. Well, let's uh, start with um, what we mean by synthetic biology. This is a new field, and we think that we know enough about, the, about life and uh, cellular life that we can put living systems back together piece by piece from what we call a parts list. And some of you may have recalled just last year that uh, the Craig Venter Institute took, uh, synthesized a piece of DNA that had the entire bacterial genome on it, inserted that into a, another bacterium that did not have any genetic information, and away it went. It started to grow and became literally a new species. That's what I mean by synthetic biology. Then we have systems biology, another new field. We don't understand life as just uh, something alive anymore. We think of it in terms of the systems of molecules that are working within a living cell with control mechanisms, feedback loops, uh, pro, you know, things that go forward, things that go backwards, a whole bunch of brakes and accelerators that are all occurring at the molecular level. Systems biology is really what life is all about at the molecular level. Finally, we have the origin of life. Now the systems biology and uh, synthetic biology are related to the origin of life because this is something that we believe as scientists occurred spontaneously on the early earth. We think that the laws of chemistry and physics are sufficient to explain how life can begin. We don't know the whole answer yet. You're going to see a progress report. It's a very active field, quite a few people working on this question, and uh, I'm going to share with you that progress tonight. So the origin of life, keep this in mind, spontaneous assembly of catalytic replicating systems of interacting molecules. And I'm going to show you how we can get to that point, knowing what we know about the molecules and about the systems. So what is the parts list of the first living systems? Well, there was no genes, there were no enzymes, there was no proteins, there was just atoms and molecules on the early Earth and a source of energy. So we know for a fact that when energy flows through a system of atoms and molecules, that the energy causes things to happen that would not happen in the absence of that energy. And we call this uh, moving, the in, moving the state of those atoms and molecules away from equilibrium. Every one of you lives away from equilibrium. 
you reach equilibrium when you're dead and gone. And that is uh, what life is all about. We live away from equilibrium. Somehow we've got to find a way to use energy sources on the early Earth to drive life, to drive those molecules away from equilibrium. So what were they? Where did they come from? For that, we have to venture into another new field. You're learning about three new fields now, synthetic biology, uh, system biology, and of all things, astrobiology. Because we think we know enough now to tell you a story about how life is not just part of a little thin layer of material at the surface of the Earth, but in fact is part of a much larger system that includes stars, planet formation, uh, the accretion of the Earth, the delivery of organic molecules, and then finally the chemistry and physics that gave rise to the first forms of life. So everything that I'm going to talk about is in this little image you see here. Stars, meteor coming in. If it lands, it's called a meteorite. Landforms and water. All of that is necessary, we think, for the origin of life. Now, let me show you one more thing. When we look at stars, our eyes don't see actual colors because we only use our rods at night to look at the stars. So they all look white, don't they? But if we leave a camera lens open, this is what we would see if we really could see the colors of stars. The camera is aimed at the North Star. That's Polaris. It hardly moves because it's... Uh, we're sort of, the Earth's spin happens to be such that the axis goes right through that North Star. And now look, you can see red stars, uh, purple stars, violet stars, green stars, blue stars. Those are the real colors of stars out there, and they all mean something. So when we look at something like that and see all those uh, literally thousands of stars visible to the naked eye, a question comes. Are we alone? Are there other planets out there upon which life could begin? And the answer is, yes, there are. And I'm going to tell you some new news that comes from what is called the Kepler telescope. Kepler is a satellite telescope circling the Earth. It's looking at one small area of the sky. And there's perhaps around 100,000 stars in that area. It just keeps looking at it. Every once in a while, one of those stars blinks. The light from it goes down a little bit. And the reason it blinks is because a planet passes in front of the star. And we see the shadow of that planet from hundreds to thousands of light years away crossing that, uh, that star. And therefore, we can deduce that, in fact, a planet is going around that star. So as of uh, just a few months ago, there was uh, about 1,200 extrasolar planets discovered by the, extra, by the Kepler survey, and here they are. If you look at every one of those, you'll see a little black spot on it. That's the uh, guess about how that planet would look if we really could see it with the naked eye. See all those little black dots? And by the way, that one lonely star right there is our sun and Jupiter to give you a perspective on what this would really be like. If you've got good eyes, you'll see a little tiny black spot, and there's our sun right down with all these other sorts of general kinds of stars that are the main class of stars out there. So isn't it wonderful that now we have 1,200 and even more? The latest I heard was from Ralph. He told me that the latest count is 1,700 that has come up in a recent report that he's heard. So the question is, is there life out there? And by the way, by life, I don't mean intelligent life. We really don't know about that. That jump from being alive to being intelligent, is a, uh, that's a big jump. What I'm talking about life is uh, lo silly little bacterial forms of life. And if we can find bacteria on Mars or elsewhere than the Earth, it's going to be a big deal. So that's really what we're going to talk about. So there's all of our extrasolar planets. And now I want to tell you about astrobiology. This is such a young field. It only started about a um, little over 10 years ago, 1996. Some of you may remember there was a report from NASA scientists that they had found fossils of life, of existing life, in a meteorite from Mars. Do you remember that? 
I happened to be in Iceland at the time with my family, and uh, I had to try to figure that out from an Icelandic newspaper <laughs> reading. I gave myself a crash course in Icelandic to see what this is all about. And there was a picture of President Clinton, and he was announcing this amazing possible discovery that fossils of microorganisms had been reported in this meteorite from Mars. Well, it turns out that there is no consensus on that yet. The people that did that, Dave McKay and his, uh, his uh, associates, still believes that they really probably did see fossils, but there's no consensus. So don't take that as fact yet. But what it did do is to activate NASA to put a bunch of money, $20 million a year, into this new field, and they called it astrobiology. So astrobiology is something new, another new science. It is the evolutionary narrative of how stars give rise to life. So the take home lesson from this part of my talk is that we really can trace the origin of life back to things that are happening in stars. And if they didn't happen in stars, we would not be here today. So it's, it's that kind of a, a meaning. Uh, so if you want to uh, get a laugh here, somebody says, uh, in a nutshell, Hydrogen is a colorless, odorless gas that, when given enough time, changes into people. <laughs> and that's astrobiology. You're going to see that that's exactly right. You give uh, hydrogen 13 billion years, the age of the universe. Uh, you give our sun about 5 billion years, and here we are. And all of that is caused by the fact that hydrogen can fuse to form helium, Helium confused to form beryllium, beryllium confused to form uh, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. So all the stuff in this room sitting in these seats before me, you all used to be part of stars. So let's just quickly take a look at that. How does hydrogen turn to helium? This is basic scientific literacy, fusion reactions. When you look at the sun, you're looking at a big hydrogen bomb in the sky. Four protons, call hydrogen, fuse together and you end up with helium and a huge release of energy. This, by the way, is what we're trying to uh, do in California at uh, the Livermore Laser Laboratory. We're focusing a whole bunch of uh, lasers onto a tiny pellet with a little form of hydrogen in it. And we hope that we will make a tiny hydrogen bomb, that this will fuse and produce energy. If that can be done, you don't have to worry about gasoline prices anymore because energy will be basically free because water is everywhere. If we can get hydrogen to fuse, it'll, it'll be a, a huge gift from science to humanity. But we haven't done it yet. At least we know it occurs in stars, and that's the energy that makes life go around because all life on Earth, with just one rare exception, depends on light from our sun. So. Uh, let's trace the lifespan of a star because stars do have lifespans. They don't live forever. They seem to live forever, but the fact is they have a lifespan. After, depending on the size of the star, after millions to billions of years of lifespan, they run out of hydrogen. And the result is that they kind of collapse on themselves and the temperature goes up. Instead of that 10 million degrees required to cause hydrogen fusion, you're now up in the 100 million degree range. That's almost, that is unimaginable. And when you get up to that point, other fusion reactions begin to produce what we call the biogenic elements, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur. If you add up all the elements of a living cell that's, that's uh, well over 90% of all the elements that make up a living cell. And your bodies, of course. This is H2O is the hydrogen and the oxygen. Carbon, of course, is the core atom that uh, makes up uh, life molecules. Oxygen and nitrogen are necessary for many of those molecules. So that is what we need to do. That is the parts list that we're going to be starting with. Finally, the stars explode and the elements are ejected into interstellar space. So we know this is happening because we can watch it happening now. We have telescopes that can watch stars go through this process. So one such star exploded about a thousand years ago. 
We know this because Chinese astronomers noted that in the sky there is a new star that could be seen in daylight time. Uh, many years later, uh, Messier looked at that. He saw a little blur that kind of looked crab-like in his uh, optical system. And so uh, that came to be known as the Crab Nebula. And here's what it looks like. This is the remains of a supernova. Oh, I didn't mean to do that yet. Sorry. Let me try to get back to where I was. Stay. <laughs> okay, so this is remains of a supernova. It's about 10 light years across now, from, uh, from around here to around there, 10 light years. Right in the center of that is a pulsar. And I, if I can make this work, you're going to hear that pulsar. And that pulsar is spinning 30 times per second, and you can actually sort of see a visible wave coming out from that pulsar. Not from the pulses, but just from the fact that this star, this neutron star, is sort of undergoing contractions and expansions that produce different amounts of light that you're going to see. And everything out here is dust and gas, and that's going to diffuse away from that exploding star and go on throughout the rest of our galaxy and give rise to new stars and planets. Now, let me see if I can uh, let you hear this. Uh, we, we didn't actually give this a test, so I'm going to see if I can make this work. So what you're going to hear now is this spinning neutron star spinning 30 times per second. It's the size of New York City. It's so dense, it's unimaginably dense. If I had a piece of it here and dropped it, go right through the floor, right on down into the, into the earth. It's that dense. And that thing is spinning that fast. Let's see if I can make this work now. Amazing? You're listening to a star. And those waves that you saw going out from the center of it are due to this, the fact that this star is sort of contracting and expanding and giving a little bit more light, a little bit less light, and you're just literally seeing that light going out from that center. That is a looped thing. It doesn't just keep doing it like that. We're just watching it for a little bit and then looping that. So that's what you're seeing. But that is the remains of a real supernova. Smaller stars, like our sun, also run out of hydrogen. Supernovas start out as big stars, 10 times the size of our sun, and they go through that nova collision. Smaller stars also go through a, uh, a type of a uh, explosion, and you can see these in what we call planetary nebula. So these are stars that have reached the end of their lifetime. There's the star. It's uh, shedding a lot of that stuff that it made, the carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, silicon, sulfur, phosphorus, all of that has been synthesized in that star, and now it's being blown out into interstellar space as a kind of a dust cloud. Uh, these images are from the Hubble. One of the, you're the first, we are the first generation really to see the beauty of these because uh, we just could not see this without the orbiting telescope and the colors and so forth. Colors are not real colors. Often they have been uh, pr put in to indicate what the stuff is. So green, for instance, might be sulfur. The uh, red might be hydrogen. This bluish stuff, I think, is probably x-rays that are from another uh, telescope uh, floating around. But nonetheless, isn't that interesting? This is called the Cat's Eye Nebula. This is called the Eskimo Nebula. Let me show you another one of these that was totally unexpected. A bubble floating around in interstellar space. So this particular star just happened to produce this beautiful bubble-like uh, structure as, as it uh, blew up and uh, this stuff went off into space. I showed this to my daughter, 10-year-old daughter, Stella, and she said, I know what that is, Daddy. I know what it is. It's the bubble that Glinda traveled in The Wizard of Oz. How about that? She was very imaginative. So I said, that's probably as good an idea as any. <laughs> okay, dust. I'm talking about that dust particles. 
this is where the Earth came from. This is what the Earth looked like in that first uh, sort of big, no, uh, big uh, dust cloud that produced uh, our solar system. These are micron-sized structures that'd be about the size of a bacterial cell. It's made of silicate mineral, pyroxene, olivine, things like that. These are just fairly ordinary minerals. And what you're gonna see a little bit later is that there is a layer of ice on this and that ice turns out to be very important to some of what I want to tell you in uh, just a little bit later. But that's what this dust looks like. We really do have uh, an indication of that. Now here is a beautiful image of star formation. This is why we're so confident that we now know what happens. Here is uh, one of these big clouds of dust and gas, the remains of previous stars that have gone through an explosion. You can see these sort of columns that uh, are here. That's uh, the interstellar dust cloud, and it's going to be giving rise to a new star, a new solar system. Right up there in the center are, uh, is a whole group of new stars that have formed uh, out of this uh, dust cloud, and their light pressure is pushing the dust away. So they've cleared out the space around that you can see, and this is, this is light from that group of stars, and this is light from those stars. Right here is a star that has already gone through its lifespan. It's uh, exploded and you can see a puff of dust here and here. And you can sort of see another ring of material that some of these uh, uh, exploding stars produced. Most important for what I want to tell you tonight is this little thing here, because that is a dusty star. That is a star like our sun five billion years ago has a, a, what's called a uh, solar nebula of dust and gas around it. It's spinning, and out of that comes planets. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you, I think, is a cartoon of this. So here we have a swirling dust and gas cloud, remains of previous stars that lived and blew up. Here we have that spinning nebular disk going around, gravitation pulls that material into our sun. It starts its hydrogen fusion reaction. Around it, some other dust accretes into planets. The light from the sun blows away all that stuff, leaving behind the planets, as you can see here, rotating around the sun. So that's our simplified image of how solar systems came to be. And one of those could be our Earth. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you is another little cartoon movie. When Earth formed, it was formed by the collision of planetesimal-sized objects. These are asteroids and comets, and they're coming together under the force of gravity, just as the other planets did. And it's a very violent process. So you can see now these explosions, these things are coming in really fast. The Earth might be one-tenth the size of its final accretion here. It's red hot from all the heat that uh, is generated by these uh, collisions. And uh, this is planet formation in action in that little slide. Now, something that you should realize is that our moon was produced by a collision about 4.4 billion years ago between a Mars-sized object and the Earth, which had not yet grown to its uh, full size. This is such a high energy process to have two planets colliding, literally worlds in collision, that both the moon that is going to be produced from that and the Earth are molten. Red hot lava temperatures in this image, which was uh, put, put together by William Hartman, one of the proposers of the collisional process of the moon formation, in this image, the moon is much closer. This is the moon. We're standing on the hot Earth's surface. This is the Earth, molten lava. Here's a disk. We had a ring around the Earth for a while, and that ring gave rise to what we now call our moon. The point of this is that these temperatures are so hot that nothing organic could have survived. Everything that's made of carbon is going to turn into gas. There's no organic materials. And that means when the Earth cooled down and oceans formed, if there's going to be organic material needed for the origin of life, it had to be either delivered or synthesized at the Earth's surface. 
We used to think it was synthesized. Uh, Stanley Miller suggested this uh, 50, 60 years ago, that there was a synthesis going on. And in fact, probably some of it was. But another thought that's come along is that s more of the material was delivered by impacts of comets and asteroids on the surface of the moon and the surface of the Earth. Here the artist has shown a collision of uh, a, a comet-sized uh, object with the Earth. Here's another one up here. So we, th we think that uh, a lot of the Earth's ocean, maybe 10%, and some organic material was delivered to the Earth to help life get started. So how do we know that? Well, so we, we have measured the amount of material in comets, for instance. And this is the nucleus of a comet named Temple 1. A NASA spacecraft orbited around this, took some beautiful close-up pictures. And if you ever wonder what a comet looked like, there you have one. It's about 60% ice, 30% dust, 10% organic carbon compounds. And we know that because we've measured these things in the tail of comet with other, with other spacecraft that have flown through. So there's a lot of organic carbon. And when I say a lot, I'm going to show you the actual size of this thing because you don't really get an impression of the size. But that's how big it really is. That's the skyline of New York City as though it were floating along with the comet to give you a sense. So this, this comet's what? Uh, maybe a kilometer in diameter, two kilometers, something like that. It's pretty big. And imagine something like this now crashing into the earth, delivering its water, and along with it, some of the organic compounds that are in that comet. So that's, that's part of the story that you want to take home from uh, tonight's talk. Well, I told you about these dust grains, and now we're going to talk about where that organic material came from that is in comets and, in, uh, these, and on these dust grains. Here's what we know. Here's a silicate uh, mineral dust grain, five microns about. There's an ice mantle, this bluish layer that you can see here is an ice mantle. There's just ice, there's water that freezes onto this dust grain because outer space is really cold. We're talking way, way below zero. It's a very cold place. Along with the ice comes methanol, carbon monoxide, and ammonia, as well as a few other gaseous materials that uh, form that ice. What we now know by direct laboratory experiments is that if ultraviolet light hits that uh, icy layer, you get a whole bunch of organic compounds, amino acids, ketones, amides, quinones, amphiphiles. Now that amphiphile is a word you're going to hear again and again. It's a molecule like a soap that has one part of the molecule that likes oil and another part that likes water. Amphiphile, that likes two different things, just like amphibians if you get that word. So amphiphiles are part of the picture and that's going to become important a little bit later. This stuff, this dust, undergoes accretion in the early solar system, remember that cartoon I showed you, to form comets, planetesimals, the organic compounds come along with that process. They get stuck in the comets and stuck in these uh, asteroids, uh, planetesimals. During the late accretion, this delivers stuff to the Earth. So the last part of Earth's accretion was comets, asteroids falling into the Earth and delivering water and organic material. Well, you're probably asking, how do we know? I'm going to show you how we know in just a moment. First, I'm going to say, what organic compounds do we need to begin life? That's pretty simple. The parts list is pretty simple. These are the molecules. We need a source of monomers to form polymers. Amino acids, for existence, form proteins. Nucleotides form nucleic acids. Those are monomers and the polymers they form. So those had to be there if we're going to start up life. You also have to have uh, compounds that produce cellular compartments. And there's that word again, amphiphiles. These are self-assembling lipid-like molecules and you're going to watch them assemble all by themselves. That's what I mean by self-assembly. Where do they come from? Well, here's an asteroid, because we think that both asteroids and comets were bombarding the Earth during late accretion. And what you notice about the asteroid is that it has craters. 
That means that there are collisions occurring in the asteroid belt. This particular asteroid is called Eros. It's an asteroid. This is probably one or two kilometers uh, from here to there. It's pretty big. You know, you could walk this in about five minutes maybe if you're a fast walker. And those impact craters that I showed you give rise to meteorites. And that's very important because when I show you the meteorites that we work on, you've got to realize that they come from impacts on asteroids. So we're actually working with extraterrestrial material that is left, that is uh, sort of uh, popped off of asteroid surfaces by impacts. Just by chance, pure luck, we saw an impact in the asteroid belt. Here, that little dot, people thought this was a comet at first, by the way, but they finally worked out there was an asteroid. Here's that little dot is an asteroid. It has been hit by another asteroid, and all of this stuff coming out are potential meteorites. If those things get to the Earth, they're going to turn up in museums all over the world. And you've all seen meteorites. If you go to museums, very likely you'll find uh, you know, meteorites in, in the larger museums. So. Those then, if they got to the Earth, give us a sample of extraterrestrial material. About, uh, what, 30, 40 years ago, 1969, over the town of Murchison, Australia, a bright light appeared in the sky. This was during the daytime. People looked up and they saw something like this. This is not an actual picture, by the way. I did this uh, with Photoshop. This is a real bolide, a real fireball. It's lighting up the clouds, lighting up the earth, and this is a landscape in uh, southern, southeastern part of Australia. I just got that off the internet. So this is just illustrative of what that would have looked like if you had been there uh, in 1969. This is Murchison, the little town in southeastern Australia where this meteorite fell. Every one of these red spots is in fact one of the pieces of the meteorite that was picked up uh, in this, what they call a strewn field where the pieces fell down. So townspeople and scientists scurried out into the field and they came back with about 100 kilograms of a real carbonaceous meteorite. I've had several samples come through my lab. This is the very first one I had. Notice it still has a fusion crust because what happens is that when the Big, the larger body comes in, it gets slowed by friction, and it gets so hot, it gets uh, sort of a shock going through it that it breaks up into smaller pieces. The smaller pieces then are still uh, being slowed by atmospheric friction, and they end up with this fusion uh, crust that you see here. If we analyze the meteorite, here's what we see. It's like a chemist's laboratory brought to the Earth from an extraterrestrial source. Here we've broken up another of my samples. We discover that uh, by weight, about one and a half percent is what is called a kerogen. This is a polymer of uh, organic material. Then there's a whole bunch of soluble organics, less than 1%, about 0.2% approximately. And of these soluble organics, there's a bunch of things called carboxylic acids, amino acids, amides, aliphatic hydrocarbons, aromatic hydrocarbons, aldehydes, alcohols, amines and even purines. Purines, by the way, are what are in DNA and RNA. It's one of the uh, bases of uh, nucleic acids. So isn't that amazing that uh, the parts list of life is being brought to the earth by extraterrestrial infall, even now? I can tell you that every year something like 30,000 tons of dust particles are entering the earth's atmosphere and delivering that much mass. And even those dust particles have organic material. So the Earth is still accreting. It's still adding organic material and still adding mineral material to the Earth's mass. So we're sort of in the last phase of the uh, Earth's accretion process. Well, this is what it looks like if you break open a meteorite. You can see that it's a lot of black uh, mineral. These are very uh, ordinary sorts of minerals, pyroxene, olivine. And you get these white pebbles throughout. These are called chondrules. And uh, this then is what a carbonaceous meteorite looks like. Now the next picture, we took a microscope and put a UV light on it and looked at the surface under high magnification. And this is what you see. The organic material 
in the meteorite is fluorescent. It is able to glow as soon as it sees ultraviolet light hitting it. So you can take a picture and see these nodules of organic material scattered throughout the meteorite and lots of little ones as well. They don't show in the slide very well, but it's just sort of like looking at a galaxy when you look down on this. We can extract that material and do what is called chromatography. You put a little drop down here. This is a, a chromatographic plate. It's a thin piece of metal with a layer of silica on it, this sort of powdered glass. And then we allow hexane and diethyl ether to move up the plate just by capillary reaction in this direction. We turn the plate sideways, let chloroform move down the plate this way, and then it separates the fluorescent material into all this stuff that you see. Well, I'm not going to talk about all of this, except to say that it is a polycyclic compounds and their derivatives, but I am going to talk about this, because if I had put an organic acid, like a fatty acid, that's where it would have showed up. So 20 years ago, I took this material, put it onto a slide, and looked at it under the microscope after adding some water. And this is what I saw. This material had never seen anything biological in all of its life, in five billion years, really. And yet as soon as it saw water, it began to self-assemble into membranous structures. These are real membranes. They can capture molecules, shown in the next slide. Here they are by what is called phase microscopy. These things, are, this one here would be about the size of a human red cell, about 10 microns across. So they go all the way up to maybe 30 microns, then down to smaller sizes. So this is the size of cells. What we did here is to make these in the presence of a fluorescent dye. And now you can see that the dye has been trapped by the membrane is inside those vesicles. So we know for a fact that there is material that has never been part of a life process, and yet it can make simple little cellular compartments. And we propose that the very first cells living on Earth use something like this to make their cell membranes. Well, what are the membrane components? They are short chain fatty acids. This is a slide in which we use mass spectrometry to analyze those membranes. And uh, there's a whole bunch of short chain, then medium chain length, 8, 9, 10, 11, and later work has shown 12 and 13 out there. Are these able to form membranes? They sure do. Look at that. That's decanoic acid, just exactly one of those um, membranes. So this is a synthetic version of what I showed you. So we know for a fact that the stuff in the meteorite is able to form membranous structures. And we say in our, uh, in our uh, talks like to, to people like yourself that we, this is very likely the simplest kind of amphiphilic molecule that can form the cellular compartments of the first forms of life. So that's one of the main stories I want to tell you. By the way, it's easy to capture big molecules in these, like DNA. Here we have captured DNA in those in decanoic acid vesicles at the 10 carbon fatty acid, and you can see it fluorescing here. So it's easy to make protocells. This is what we call a protocell. It's a compartment with something inside it. It's a step toward the origin of life, even though it's not alive itself. Well, I'm talking about self-assembly, and I think that the only way for life to have begun on the Earth is by a self-assembly process because there were no genes, there's no enzymes, nothing to tell life how to begin. So it had to start by some spontaneous process. And here are some self-assembling molecules that we know about. If you have a single nucleic acid strand, it can self-assemble into a double helix. And there's the double helix of DNA. If you have a single strand of protein that has just been produced by a ribosome in a cell, it folds up into the active conformation of the protein. So here's a folded protein. And then if you have lipid present, it self-assembles into membranous vesicles. So if we want to synthesize life in the laboratory, we're going to use stuff like this and capture it in a compartment like this and that's exactly what we're doing now. We want to self-assemble models of the first kinds of life on the early Earth. I think the next one is going to show you a self-assembly process. 
And you're going to hear a little bit of music with it. It goes on for about a minute. And you're going to see what I see under the microscope when I look. Oop, not quite yet. Modern lipid looks like this. This is a phospholipid. This is cholesterol. So when I say fatty acid, this is what I'm talking about. Single chain coming to a hydrophilic head group. It's an acid because it can release a proton. If you're a chemist, you know that anything that releases a proton is an acid. So those membranes I showed you were being produced by stuff like this. Modern membranes, the membranes of every cell in your body, use phospholipid and cholesterol for their amphiphiles. Okay, now let's see if I don't have this movie for you. So that's what lipid does. Add a little water, self assembles into membranes, and that, I think, is part of the picture that we have now of how life could begin, because this is a spontaneous process. If we could look at that process, a membrane, up close, what we would see is that all membranes, most membranes, are formed of lipid bilayers. So the lipid actually has its hydrocarbon tails, the oily portion, on an interior side of the membrane. We're seeing a cross section through the membrane, and the hydrophilic head groups are out here and out here. I show a few water molecules. Uh, this would actually be just pure water out here and out here. So that is, uh, is important to the origin of life and to life today as all the nucleic acids and proteins and so forth, because without that membrane, life could not exist in the form of cells. So if we're going to find the origin of life, we really find, want to find a, um, something that can make membranes like that. Well, everything I've shown you has been done in a laboratory. And I was interested in seeing whether this could happen in a prebiotic environment. And we don't have a prebiotic environment now, but what we have are environments that look like what we think the prebiotic Earth looked like. Charles Darwin preceded me in this thinking. He preceded a lot of people in, in their thinking, in fact. He's an extraordinary individual. And in a letter to his friend, uh, Hooker, how about that? This, this is the Hooker talk I'm giving, right? OK, one of a distant relative. But if, and oh, what a big if, we could conceive in some warm little pond, keep that in mind, with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, et cetera, present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. At the present day, such matter would be instantly devoured or absorbed, which would not have been the case before living creatures were formed. So he was thinking ahead already to how life could begin, and he thought it might be a warm little pond. Well, it's a little bit different than that. Uh, we think that life began in a pretty hot environment. This is an artist version of what the early Earth looked like about four billion years ago, probably before life began, or about the same time as. There were volcanic land masses, lots of heat. The atmosphere was carbon dioxide and nitrogen. The moon was a lot closer than it is now. It's slowly been moving away from the Earth. There was salty oceans, 
But there's also freshwater ponds because as these clouds form, they would precipitate as rain on these uh, volcanic land masses just as it does in Hawaii today. And you'd have these freshwater ponds building up. So let's take a closer look at that. And this is a very well-known picture of, uh, in the basement of the Smithsonian of the prebiotic earth. And right down here is what I think we might want to look for in Darwin's warm little pond, but I would call it a hot little puddle. So when we go off to volcanoes, we're going to be looking for something like this to try and experiment. So now we're going to go to Kamchatka, because Kamchatka is an analog of the early Earth, in my judgment. It's a volcanic landmass. There's nothing alive in the upper regions of these volcanoes. Uh, high altitude, high latitude, recent volcanism. They produce sterile sites for experimental analysis. And my question is, can self-assembly occur under natural conditions? So Kamchatka looks like this. If you're in a satellite, taking a picture looking downward, it's a very volcanic region. Here's this whole line of volcanoes up and down the uh, eastern coast. This is Petropavlovsk, that's the biggest little town in all of Kamchatka. By the way, this thing is the size of California. It's a big peninsula. And right here is Mount Butnovsky. And we're going to land at Petropavlovsk on a plane from Alaska, going to rent a uh, Russian troop carrier for about $20 a day with a driver and his wife. And they're going to cook for our little expedition. And they're going to drive us from Petropavlovsk, about a five-hour drive, to Mount Butnovsky. So here's our gang. This is a little group of scientists that went off on the second, my second trip to Kamchatka. This is uh, Jan and Jake, and they are postdoctoral students at uh, the Carnegie Institution of Washington. This is Jamie and Megan. They were graduate students at Stanford University. This is Vladimir Kompenichenko, and he was our local organizer. Very smart guy, also a scientist. This is Igor. Igor was our driver of the truck and kind of knew his way around uh, the Metnovsky area. And this is Tony Hoffman, who's my neighbor from down the street. He just came along for the ride. <laughs> he had a good time, too, believe me. He took a lot of the pictures I'm going to show you. So here we are now climbing. We're about 2,000 feet above where we parked that truck and where we camped for about a week, climbing up an ice field to get into the crater of Kamchatka. Looking down into the crater is a spectacular sight. There's still active volcanism going on down here. There's uh, snow fields melting down into this crater. There's nothing alive. This thing uh, had an explosion in the year 2000, and we were there in 2002. So uh, there's nothing alive, not even bacteria when you get down into here. And uh, this is Vladimir kind of looking down. So when I think about the early Earth, this is one of the images I have. It's a volcanic environment, hot, with water, steam, sulfur, very much. Oops. So I took some samples. We're down in the crater now. This is what's called a fumarole, uh, just sort of an opening down into a boiling mud pit. I had a, about a 15-foot aluminum pole reach down into there and brought out a sample. And we took that and many other samples back to my laboratory where we analyzed it. We asked, are there, is there anything alive in there? Is there any uh, organic compounds in there? And there was nothing that was completely empty of anything organic, either alive or as organic compounds. So we decided to revise Darwin's uh, little uh, uh, phrase. And we're going to say, but if, and what a big if, we could conceive in some hot little puddle with all sorts of prebiotic amino acids and nucleobases, lipids for membranes, phosphoric salts, light heat, etc. So we're going to try that experiment with a little more modern set of uh, conditions. So here's a hot little puddle on Mount Manoski. And these are all over the earth. They're in Iceland, they're in New Zealand, they're in California. There's a place called Bumpus Hill that we use as a field site. So this little boiling puddle closed off. There's no water flowing through it. So it's, uh, we can just dump stuff in. And what I did is to dump in this set of organic materials. And I really want to do this experiment. This is what I proposed to Ralph in our interactions. I would like to see what happens if we have a sufficiently complex 
a set of soups, a set of organic compounds in a, in a uh, hydrothermal environment like that puddle. Four amino acids, glycine, alanine, valine, aspartate, about a gram each. Four nucleobases, adenine, uracil, guanine, cytosine, about one gram each. Phosphate, glycerol, myristic acid, that's the amphiphile. I'm going to sample that over a question of minutes to days, and I'm going to ask if any self-assembly can occur. So here we are. I'm pouring that milky soup into the middle of that pond, and here's what we found. Watch the little arrow. Right there, that frothy material appeared within minutes. That is self-assembled membranes of the fatty acid that we put in. So it didn't just sort of disappear into the, into the uh, clay uh, mud that was there. It separated itself and turned into little frothy vesicles. And inside those vesicles were samples of the stuff that I had there. So we're pretty sure that uh, this kind of a environment will allow self-assembly to occur. Even though it's very hot, pretty acidic, it's like one millimolar sulfuric acid. And uh, my guess is this is what we really want to uh, do as a simulation in the laboratory to see whether we can't get some uh, interesting polymerization reactions going. OK, let's think now, sort of, by the way, sort of getting into the last part of my talk. And uh, if you'll just hang in there, we're going to dive down into molecules now. And I'm going to try to explain things as we go along. Here's what I think is needed for the origin of cellular life. From synthetic biology, we have to have self-assembly of encapsulated systems. And that's got to be spontaneous. It's just going to happen. We have to have what I call combinatorial chemistry, because each of these encapsulated systems is different from all the rest. Each one of them is an experiment, a natural experiment. And one milligram of lipid form trillions of vesicles. So that's a lot of experiments of combinations of various materials. So that provides sufficient complexity. And it's provided by this organizing lipid matrix that helps these things get together and stay together. The conditions, I think we have to have fluctuating wet-dry cycles to provide the energy, such as the wet-dry cycles that occur at the edges of these volcanic pools that I've just shown you, that they're constantly being wetted and dried, wetted and dried. I think that provides energy. The compartments made by this lipid matrix maintain these systems of molecules, and they concentrate. Whatever's there gets concentrated within that lipid matrix. So we want to add some monomers. Doesn't matter what kind, just uh, most likely nucleotides, amino acids. And we have to have a source of energy to drive bond formation. Because life today depends on polymerization. You're all just lumps of polymers. You're protein. That's, that's what uh, life is all about. You make new proteins, you grow. Uh, that's the growth process. Some of the polymers can replicate. The DNA can replicate. That's also got to be in there have to have catalysis. So we're looking for all of those things as we, uh, as we get into the origin of life. OK, now here's a new, something new for you. I've been telling you about vesicles, but I haven't told you about lipid matrices. If you have vesicles, as I've shown you, and there's stuff outside the vesicles, it turns out that when you dry, the vesicles fuse to form a multilamellar matrix, so just layer after layer of lipid. And notice that the stuff that was outside is now trapped between alternating layers. When you add water back, the vesicles self-assemble, but now some of the stuff that was outside has now been trapped inside. A very easy way to make uh, protocells, to make things that have large, large uh, stuff inside, such as nucleic acid. So that just tells you uh, what I just told you. Here's the proof of what I just said. Here are vesicles by a special technique of electromicroscopy called freeze fracture. What you do is you freeze the specimen, you fracture it, then you look at the surface, and you can sort of see the vesicles uh, in the surface. If you dry it out, this is what it looks like. It goes from vesicles to a multilamellar lipid matrix. I think that's very important because it has a special property, the ability to organize and to concentrate 
monomers that were present along with the vesicles. Here is the kind of molecule that we think was essential for life to begin. This is called adenosine monophosphate, or AMP. There are four bases in the DNA in the human body, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. The adenine is the A, and this is adenine right here. It's attached to a ribose, and the ribose is attached to a phosphate, so it's called adenosine monophosphate. Here's a side view. I show you the side view because when we make the lipid matrix, what we do is to organize and concentrate that nucleotide, which is, as I say, we hope will turn into a nucleic acid. We organize and concentrate it in a very thin layer between these lipid head groups. And when that, when that concentration effect occurs, you can get chemistry to happen. You can get bond formation. And if there are organic chemists in the audience, this is the mechanism. It's, uh, I won't go through it. Uh, it's just a resonance uh, producing a phosphorylium cation. It allows a nucleophilic attack, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, water is lost, and you form that bond right there, and that allows nucleic acids to be produced. Nucleic acids are produced by the removal of a water molecule from between a phosphate and a ribose group. That's really all there is to it. Our body does it metabolically. This, we think, happens spontaneously. So the question is, does it work? And the answer is yes. Uh, Rajamani, Sudha Rajamani, was a postdoc in my lab. She published this paper in uh, a journal called Origins of Life in 2008. What Rajamani did, what Sudha did with several other workers in her lab, is to say, if RNA is there, if we made it, we should be able to treat it with enzymes that let a radioactive phosphate go on to the end of any RNA molecules. Everything you see here that's black is radioactive RNA. We made RNA just by the simple process of drying down, letting the lipid organize the stuff, rehydrating, drying it down, rehydrating, and every cycle, one cycle, three cycles, five, six, seven, you get more and more. Now here's something else that you won't know about unless you're, you've done this kind of work. This is called a ladder. This is 10 nucleotides, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 100 up there. And if you bring your eye from here to here, you'll see that we're making things that are really long. 100 nucleotides long. All we have to do is dry it down, wet it, you know, up and down, up and down, and you can drive the synthesis of RNA molecules. Well, there's one last point of the story which I think is as even more interesting. Early life had to have a way to replicate molecules. You put in one kind of molecule, you make the replicate of it. It's called a complementary strand. If you add a template, that's called a template, that's the original starting strand, that'd be right here, and notice there's four colors, and those four colors indicate the four bases of DNA. If you just dry it down with the monomers present, you get a glassy solid, and it doesn't have a chance to do very much because everything is just sort of stuck. But if you dry it in the presence of lipid, in that lipid matrix that I've shown you, this stuff can swim around and each base can pair up with its complementary base, blue with yellow, blue with yellow, uh, red with green, blue with yellow, uh, red with green. And when it lines up that way, it has a chance to form those ester bonds and form a complementary strand. That's the idea. Does it work? Here it is. Published uh, just last January, Felix Elastigosti, another postdoc in our lab, was the lead author. Non-enzymatic transfer of sequence information under plausible prebiotic conditions. Well, that basically says that we've discovered a way to get DNA to undergo a kind of a replication. So here's some of the evidence we have. In the complete system where we can measure the amount of double-stranded DNA that's put in by using a dye, fluorescent dye that is specific for double strand, we see that the complete system makes uh, about 20, 25 nanograms per mil of DNA in the double-stranded form. 
All these others don't work nearly as well. These variety of controls that uh, leave out one part of the complete system. We could then take this material, put it onto a gel, and there's a double-stranded DNA stain showing that the original template, which is about 55 nucleotides long, produces this stain right here, right where you expect it. So we're pretty sure that we made some double-stranded DNA even though we put in just that single strand. I'm almost to my last slide, just hang in there. We then took that material with the arrow and sequenced it. Very complicated thing to do, by the way, because these are all sorts of different links and so forth, but it is, was possible to do. We strung it all together, did a sequence, and we did what is called a bioinformatics analysis, where we looked for complementary sequences that would be expected if replication had occurred. If all we made was random DNA, it would all be down in here with very little alignment. However, we saw a lot of product that was way up in the alignment score. And all of these indicate that we had, in fact, transferred information, sequence information, from the template strand to the, to the product strand. So we're very happy about this, and we're now applying for grant funds to go to the next step and see where we can take this. Well, here are my conclusions. Activation or addition of self-assembling lipid provides a sufficient complexity for RNA synthesis. We know that now. The monomers become ordered within the liquid crystalline matrix. Phosphodiester bond synthesis produces RNA-like polymers. The next question is, how can we get those polymers to begin to evolve? Because life has to evolve. So we're going to try to get molecular evolution started up. We don't know quite how to do that, but our colleague Jack Silstack has begun to do this sort of system. Jack, by the way, won the Nobel Prize last year for his work on, uh, in uh, medicine. And uh, he worked on a thing called telomerase, a, uh, an enzyme that is very important to uh, cell division. Uh, and what Jack has done with his students here, uh, Sheriff, Jason, uh, some of these people I don't know, there's Jack, Nature 2008. He put a piece of incomplete double-stranded DNA into a fatty acid membrane. He added substrate outside and clearly showed that the substrate could get into, here's some getting into the uh, interior compartment, and then adding to the uh, double helix to make the complete double helix. Furthermore, he could show that under certain conditions, these could divide. So we're getting pretty close to matching the properties of life. Here's a system that can make more of itself, make, uh, you know, add sequence uh, information, and also undergo a process of division. Well, if you uh, liked what you've heard tonight, there's two books that just became available. Uh, Jack and I edited uh, a, this is a scientific version of what I've told you. There's 20 chapters there by different authors. We call it The Origins of Life. It's all yours for 135 bucks, but for only $16 at Amazon, you can buy this as First Life, and it's the book that just came out uh, in this month, and I have my advanced copy here someplace. So 16 bucks, what a bargain, you know, buy it. Okay, I'm done, thank you very much, and I'll take any questions.